And I have the great pleasure tonight to introduce Margot Neal and Lynn Kelly. And Margot and Neil have published, Mar Margot and Lynn, sorry, have published this marvellous book, Songlines, The Power and the Promise. And it's the first in a series called First Knowledges. Now, the First Knowledges story, that the First Knowledges books are about First Nations Australian voices speaking to us about science and understanding and finding, finding a way for us to, to work together to really understand that this is a, a nation with a history far, far greater uh, than what, we, what, what colonial society uh, understands. Before we start, and I will be handing over because listening to me babble is not what you're here for, let's acknowledge that uh, we're broadcasting from Jar Jar Warung country and we acknowledge the traditional owners of this country and pay our respects to elders past and present. And I'll hand over to Margot to continue the acknowledgement. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much um, um, for that. I, I'd like to acknowledge the Jar Jar Wurrung. I'd also like to acknowledge um, all the other Aboriginal people through various historic circumstances who have found themselves on the Jar Jar Wurrung lands and to acknowledge my own people, the Gunai Kurnai and the Kulin Nations and my Gumbanga people in the Northern Rivers and um, Wiradjuri um, in, from New South Wales. I'm currently standing on the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples in the Canberra region. And so I would clearly like to acknowledge them as well. So um, I just cannot, Every time we do this acknowledgement of a country, I cannot tell you how it gladdens my heart because 20, 30 years, 20 years ago even, this would not happen. And if it happened, it would be a very rare event. And now, I mean, I go to stuff all the time and it's, it's an absolute um, essential protocol regardless of your political persuasion. Uh, regardless of your interest in things Aboriginal or not, it's now become such an institutionalised thing and it, that all goes very well for a lot of other things. Thank you. Lynn, could I start with you perhaps? Could you introduce yourself and talk a little about your work? Uh, I'm Lynn Kelly and I live in Castlemaine, so I'm a local and uh, I did research into, I'm a science writer and an educator, and my research into Indigenous stories from a incredibly ignorant state uh, led me to the shocking realisation of how much is memorised when my natural memory is appalling. And I started asking, this is 12 years ago when I started a PhD, how the hell do they do it? And of course, the fundamental of the way it's done through song lines and since then I've had a PhD in academic book and the memory code and memory craft published and now with Margot which is sort of most the hype for me because I'm a huge admirer I, I went to the exhibition which I hope she'll talk about not Margot you'll talk about seven sisters song lines exhibition at Canberra mm -hmm. and was absolutely blown away by it um, and realised I'd still only glimpsed. And now to be working with her is a privilege. Okay, could, um, could I ask the same from you, but could you also talk a little bit about the series and, and what was the motivation to create this, um, to, to begin publishing this series? Uh, who are you asking? I'm asking you. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, it's it's very interesting. It's one of those sort of things when the moons line up. I you know I got into the whole song lines thing because I've been seven or eight years working on an exhibition, um, and um, and then and then I set up. I changed the name of my department in the National Museum of Australia from God knows what it was, something like Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander programs or something like that straight into the Centre for Indigenous Knowledges. And somehow out of this ether, 
arrives, Sally Heath, um, from Thames and Hudson, who says, oh, we'd love to do, we want to do this first knowledge series. And, you know, in, I have to say, it, I can't put a time on it, but I have to say, I haven't heard people refer to Indigenous material as knowledges for, you know, until the last few years, right? It's always myths, legends, you know, um, I don't know what was used, but the word knowledge has become as it should, because that's what it's about. But anyway, Sally Heath, Thames and Hudson, they came up with this first knowledge series, which is absolutely extraordinary for the education market, consisting of six readers. Now, there may be readers, the readers in a lovely kind of format that you have there, but they're still 40 to 50,000 words. We just don't have lots and lots of colour plates to, um, so that now it is very accessible, selling for always under, you know, $20. And it's, um, so I have to give credit to Thames and Hudson and to Sally Heath for coming up with it. Just so happens to totally dovetail into where people like Lynn and myself and the National Museum, and we are ge more generally in the Indigenous space. And the, oh, sorry, what I should say is the other one, this is song lines, and as it should be, the first one should be song lines because song lines are the foundational truths of this country for all of us, black or white, and it's, it's our central premise for the creation of this country and everything that emanates from us, which we'll get into. Um, so it's absolutely prime that it's first, and then it's followed by uh, Indigenous knowledges in... Um, Things like land management with Bruce Pascoe and Bill Gamage. Then the, the second one actually is called Design, which is called Building on Country. Everyone has a country focus. And then the, um, you know, this one's astrology, and then it's medicine, and then it's innovation, and so I on. And astronomy, for please, Margot, not astrology. No, astronomy. I always get that wrong. Thank you very much. Astronomy, that's why Lynn's very useful. She keeps me in line. <laughs> astronomy, I always say astrology. Anyway, so that's all. The main point is there's at least six, um, uh, you know, different average Indigenous practices that have been, in, for the purposes of the education market, been given a subject heading, whereas in actual fact, as you will find when you read each of these, that they actually don't compartmentalise in the way it may appear. But we do have to address our audience, and they do come through a Western um, education system, but it will, with, it will totally expand um, people's worldview, and it will create a very, uh, those who read through them all, as you will, as, if you've read song lines, uh, will give a very integrated concept um, of how one knows stuff and how one should learn stuff. Thanks, Robin. So I'm going to do, I'm, I'm going to back off because. Okay, for, all right. For the first um, half hour before the audience joined, I had the privilege of listen to, listening to oh, okay, okay. bounce off each other. Uh, so I, I hand the virtual floor to you both and uh, I can enjoy. So thank uh, you. Oh, but don't, everyone should just, as Lynn just did, don't hesitate to pop in whether I hear you or not is another question. Um, well, I'll, I'll kick off on, uh, you know, it's, it's very, <gasps> it's a very uh, big topic and I could choose to start uh with my background and how much or rather how little I knew about song lines in my growing up years but probably before we go any further I should actually explain the term song lines um the term song lines is is actually a cross-cultural word that was coined by Bruce Chatwood in 1987 when he did that rather famous book called song lines and he's a British journalist who came to the, this country mostly through the centre, the desert, the centre, um, and he raced around and he talked to lots of people, he saw lots of things, and he, he was 
grappling for a way of explaining the Aboriginal worldview. And interestingly enough, he did know the importance of song and performance and how somehow these help people know where they were and where they were going, both in a cartographic sense, but in a uh, identity sense and in a relationship sense and in, in you know multiple multiple ways so which is very interesting because he came up with this word which is instantly accessible to black fellas and white fellas so it was taken up with great alacrity by Aboriginal people as a way of um, explaining what then was being called the dreamings or the dream time now the dream time we don't use anymore because that's kind of got a like there's a that's a very western sense of time that it's very fixed in one place whereas time in the indigenous world is not at all fixed it's it's like there's an expression we use like um when you look behind you you see the future in your footprints you know so your identity is always in front of you but it comes from behind so it's a very uh, some people call it a circular sense of time or you can call it a spiral sense of time. Anyway, somehow or other with the term song lines, he actually um, clinched it. He actually made, came up with a word that people could actually get a handle on. As I said, black fellas and white fellas. Because the black fellas, the Aboriginal people from the desert, um, they have their own more language words like Altira or um, are or depend on which part of the country you're in so that's kind of their own talk amongst themselves in language but to talk out externally outside their own language group this became an extremely useful and um, convenient term like all cross-cultural terms though it is not precise and it will always be subject to imprecision and ambiguity and never be able to be pinned down precisely. But in the story, but people will get the sense. The best you can do is get the sense of what song lines are. Get a sense of it, right? Now, even if you ask an Aboriginal Dukupa, a fellow who subscribes to the Dukupa from, you know, Anangu from the APY lands, you know, if you ever said to them, what? What, as we did sillily like 10 years ago, what can you define Jukaba or something like that? That It's like, well, it's the law. Full stop. That's it. That's the explanation. It's like saying to a white fella, well, what is life? Like, how do you define life? You know, how do you, I think, go to some, you know, inane, you know, scientific explanation of, chemicals and so on but you know what is living what is life you, it's just to a anangu for example um the the song lines like the chukupa is just the law it is as it is that's all there's about it but then from say the 90s when it became more vogueish the word song lines tended to replace previous terms um so the word dreamings and um, song lines become interchangeable in usage. They do actually have, uh, in my interpretation, it's always only interpretive, right? In my interpretation, they, there are differences. Now, let's go back a bit. Now, song lines are a knowledge system, right? If I was talking to you 10 or 15, 20 years ago, no, that would be absolutely the most insane thing you could ever say, you know, that it was a knowledge system because we only had myths and legends and fables and and our history was a footnote in Australian history but now is the right moment as Victor Hugo would say you know uh, the right idea at the right time is more powerful than all the armies in the world so and this is the right time so um so it's it's a it's um a knowledge system which is totally embedded in country and in order to explain that to visualize if you want to visualize it you'd visualize it as corridors or pathways of knowledge which crisscross the country um and have been and are laid down over millennia it's almost like 
a body, you know, how we refer to mother, uh, you know, it's, um, it's a bit twee, but it's a very good visual metaphor that we refer to the countries as mother, as our mother, and that the we belong to the country, the country doesn't belong to us, and that um, all this sort of arterial, you know, arteries that exist in a human body kind of exist and throb and live and feed each other, but there, even when bits get damaged, bits are amputated, as in colonization, or damaged in a whole range of other ways, these arterials or these arteries, like song lines, like pathways, like dreaming tracks, may get um, become defunct for a period of time, but with enough um, uh, nurturing and healing, they can come back into existence but perhaps in a different form. So if you see the country as this body of arteries and blood vessels and hearts and lungs and all of that, then you'll get a sense of how song lines work. So, so people, so traditionally, for example, not only traditionally, people still do today, but, but traditionally particularly, you would... You would um, walk between what we call sites of knowledge, which are various features in the land, rivers, mountains, escarpment, caves, waterholes, whatever. And, and, it, and you'd come walk across and you'd link one site to the next site you come to it. And these sites are like libraries. They're like uh, repositories of knowledge. And your interaction with that knowledge in those sites or nodes or whichever word you want to use um, nurtures both you as a human being who learns something about why there's a cascade of red rocks, which is where there was an ancestral battle or why there is water because a certain incident occurred um, and a lot of these incidents are incidents which have morality and ethics associated with it. This shouldn't have happened. This is what happened. There is no water in this water hole now because that ancestral being misbehaved in a certain way, right? So there's you know, always something important to know about how to survive in the desert in this case, but everywhere. And um, for any transgressions, all sorts of stuff are embedded in these nodes of knowledge, these sites, these places. So when you travel the country across all the, the parts that are your country, you do, don't have rights to do this on other people's countries, you will pick up knowledge over years, over time, and so on. Now, it doesn't mean, so you, you sort of become, a human becomes like a mobile library, right? And then you deposit that knowledge to other people to other places in different time periods and then um so so what happened in fact oh, so, so basically if you want to learn if you want to learn your knowledge you've got to travel country and you learn learn from country right that's the basis because this is don't forget a non-text based society and you cannot even you know it's you cannot overestimate the power of how much knowledge is then carried on into the songs. For example, you know, my husband was traveling along the Canning Stock Route with um, some Aboriginal people from, you know, that the Pilbara region. And these, these are, you know, relative young fellas are like 40s or something. And as they're traveling along in a car on a man-made kind of road, they uh, get it, they see various hills or trees or outcrops and they go, no, 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 and they start to sing. And when they sing, and then at one, and this is happening, then they move on, and they go, no, 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 and they start to sing again. Then they got to one particular point, and one of the young fellas said to my husband, hey, stop, there's a water hole on the other side of that escarpment on the left hand side of the road. And he said, oh, I have what, you've been here before? No, I haven't been here before. How do you know? It's in the song. He said, no, I'm, I'm talking like three or four years ago. 
And he said, no, it's in the song. Well, what song? My, the song my auntie taught me. You know, so, and he says, you know, he expected to, uh, as you would like, well, yeah, that's but where's the where's the map? You know, so he, he, he they, they sort of hop out and they hop out and scramble up this hat, scramble up this escarpment, and there it was. There's a border hole on the other side of the escarpment that was just on the road. So there's multiple stories like that. It's incomprehensible in a way to get your head around it. But you know, in the book you will see many other stories like that. So you know, you may then. Well, how are we going for time? Better keep an eye on me. Uh, so when do you want me? It's 7.25. So how long, Robin? I think we're, uh, we've got an hour, Margo. No, but how long for me? So that my mate gets her turn. Oh, when she's five ready. Five more she minutes? <laughs> yeah, five, five minutes. More. And then, then, then let Lynn come in. Okay. So, um, so, um, Lynn will talk more about, um, you know, how this is relevant to today and to learning and, and so on. But for me to go on, you know, one, one point further is that, that the exhibition that was called Songlines Tracking the Seven Sisters, which was a huge, you know, success for a whole range of reasons and mostly because, as I said, this is a time, you know, in the eye, the, the right time in history for this knowledge, for these stories, but also mostly because I've worked with um, traditional custodians from across the three deserts, from the Maru, NP Wylands, uh, you know, I don't know, or your audiences may not know, but um, across the, um, the top of South Australia, it's called the tri-state border area, Uluru, that kind of area and beyond and NPY lands, it's kind of central West Australia, up to the top of the Pilbara and the Kimberley. So there's sort of three major areas. We travel like 7,000 kilometres and probably, you know, 500,000 square kilometres in area uh, over uh, multiple years. Now, these, the, what happened is the, the elders were old, as elders often are, and they were very concerned that their young fellows were not interested in going to the country, hanging out in the bush with the old people anymore, as in the old days, right? So the transfer of knowledge has to occur usually on country between people in an ordinary everyday uh, exchange process of learning, hunting, gathering, sitting around the campfire. That's not happening, right? The young fellows are all over there plugged in, screams in their faces, doing what the young fellows are doing all over the place. And so, so, they, so the Aboriginal people, um, elders, knew that all of them really had a limited period left, and many of them are on dialysis and have a lot of other issues. And they, they were very proactive and strategic, and they thought, you know, these young fellows, they're living in this digital, this thing called the digital world, you know, so maybe we're going to put our knowledge in that digital world. So well, let's digitize the dreaming, which is kind of what this exhibition in part was about. And, and then I thought, well, yeah, let's make culture so cool that, you know, they all want to learn the dances, they want to learn the songs, they all want to learn it. It would be just come to camp at form, you know, a bit of, be a bit of big note yourself. So, um, so one thing led to another, and um, we went on this huge journey over these years, preserving, or oh, once, I must tell you, one old fella, um, called David Miller at a meeting in Canberra in 2011, leaned over the table and said, you know, our song lines, they've all been broken up. It isn't very hushed and weighty tones. Our song lines all been broken up and we need you mob to help us put them back together again. It's a bit of a Humpty Dumpty story <laughs> in a way. Can I get you to hold that thought and I'll oh. just go over to Lynn. Oh, great. Okay. I'm ready Lynn, to, to pick that up again when Lynn's um, spoken. Yep. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Can you imagine what fun it was working with Margaret? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, these song lines are really critical. And at the end of what I want to say, I want to go back to Margot and pick up that exact point because that exhibition and what's happened as a result of it, I think is really important. But if you think about songlines, 
which as the knowledge system, as Margot described, it's as if the First Nations people had read all the latest research on neuroscience <laughs> and developed the perfect knowledge system. And if we add writing and technology and creating what Margot has coined the term the third archive, we can have it all. And hopefully she'll then come back to the third archive with the exhibition, good mm -hmm. she's nodding. So in Western encyclopedia terms, what the songlines do have mastered a system without text, which has um, headings, animals, plants, genealogies, climate and seasons. Can you imagine everything that's in an encyclopedia with all of this stuff, all in memory, land management, geography, astronomy, not astrology, calendar, <laughs> natural resources. Rub it in, Lynn, rub it in. <laughs> oh, I intend to. <laughs> Wait till the launch, Margot. Oh. <laughs> Natural resources, ecology, religion, laws, ethics. All of this is embedded in the song lines grounded in country. And what's brilliant for our education system is to think they ground the base level. The so stories and songs we hear are equivalent to what's taught to children and are solidly linked to the locations in country, forming what I'll described as a memory palace. And then they layer information on and higher and higher and hit all the stuff, the philosophy and um, hypothesis and all the higher levels of thinking once they've grounded the knowledge. And I think that's something that we really can learn. I, I'm always on about learn from, not just about. And so that's really important. Now, in terms of the neuroscience that I'm sure they read by somehow, it's the every time being everywhere. And I think Margot, yeah, the, yes. they got the neuroscience 60,000 years ago. Yeah. In the hippocampus of our brains, which is when we take short term to long term memory, uh, when we remember something or learn something, we actually cause physical changes in the brain. And I, I still find this astounding physical neural networks are laid down. And if you don't reinforce them, they, they're there somewhere, but you can't get to them. But this is plasticity. Your brain is changing and the recent research has shown that that will continue for your whole life if you keep using it. Now, if you see traditional Aboriginal cultures and Torres Strait Islanders, cultures they are singing throughout their life so let's look at what they're doing in terms of the brain because they the ceremonies song lines are uh, a combination of song and movement and art and narrative and place of course that combination is exactly the optimum of what your brain loves so song or music you may have seen um uh documentaries about people with quite advanced mm. dementia and play familiar song and they'll respond because song and music is stored really deep in the human brain. So why do we sing little kids, have them sing their alphabets and that? And then from then on, we sing things like, I love you, I love you, I can't live without you. And all that. why aren't we singing knowledge throughout our lives? And so song and music, which is a basis of the way indigenous cultures work all over the world, but at the moment we're focusing on Australia's cultures, uh, music is critical. So the more we can sing our information, the more it'll retain because you retain songs far better than you retain straight po prose. The second is movement. Um, on song lines at these sites, information is performed it's sung and it's movement because movement is a way to express information that you can't express any other way. Can you imagine explaining the behavior of a kangaroo um, to a hunting party, standing still and describing it or demonstrating it? And Aboriginal dancers are incredible in their ability to uh, reflect that behavior really accurately. You don't want to get out there and have to call out, hey, Joe, the ruse over there. So the dancers in advance um, combined with song, you're now got the brain really powerful. Art is another thing the brain remembers visual connections better than it remembers things that are 
pages of text. If you're going to study anything, please don't type out your notes because every page will look exactly the same. Indigenous art is storytelling. It is knowledge represented, but represented in a way that's far, far more memorable. And then we get to narrative. So if you take the Seven Sisters song lines that um, Margot is going to come back to at the end, that story that goes right across uh, the whole country um, gives you a sequence to that information. And that sequence story is much easier to remember and give a sequence and make sure you don't lose anything than other things, uh, than just isolated songs and so on. So there's now this incredible structure. The brain likes novelty. So if information is presented in a novel new way, it's uh, more memorable. So what you get is every performance is slightly different. Each performer brings their own. I think Margot described it to me, she might correct me on this and interrupt, as the skeleton of a body is the same, as in the information stored, but the flesh put on it can vary completely and be individual, which adds novelty and the brain loves novelty. So you combine song, movement, art, narrative, novel, novelty and performances, and then you add place. Now the 2000, and that's the song lines, that's country. The 2014 uh, Nobel Prize for Medicine talked was given to people that talked about the place cells in the human brain and the way that the brain works by mapping information and you create temporal snapshots. So if I go to a particular location, let's say I'm going to put in a list of all the countries in the world in order, starting with the biggest China and going all the way down to the Vatican and at, you know the smallest. I'm going to start at my front door over there. I'm not turning the computer around and I want to put in China. If I think or even better go to the front door and see someone delivering a Chinese meal or anything else that gives me China, then I've got a link that my brain, every time it sees that door, especially if it's reinforced by ceremony regularly, uh, will link to China. That's the base level. And now I can layer more and more and more information at that level, or I can go on to India at the next location over under the bookcase where there's a Bollywood production going on every time under my bookcase. So I can then link to each of those locations and over time add more and more and more information forever. It's hypertextual. The more I perform, so for India, I actually got down on the floor and looked under it to see the Bollywood production. That movement, there's no way I'm ever gonna lose India from that location. So what song lines have done, have taken all the most recent research on neuroscience and plasticity and whacked it into a knowledge system which is performed and associated with country. Now this method is global. Uh, my research, my PhD started 12 years ago and the book since, um, I've looked at Native American, uh, Pacific Island, the Inca, um, they're no longer there but it was all documented by the horrible Spanish invaders. Africa, every indigenous culture has developed some way of linking to country, to, place. I keep turning it using the term landscape and Margot keeps correcting me because landscape, place, place, because yeah. landscape's the geography. Yeah. When you add all this other stuff, it's no longer just landscape. Am I no. all right there, Margot? Yeah. <laughs> um, I learned so much nuance working on this book. So um, and the Native American pilgrimage trails work exactly the same. The Inca Secas, C-E-Q-U-E-S, my Spanish is appalling. They all work exactly the same way. But in Australia, we have the longest continuous culture on the world, in the world. And a resource that no one else has. Uh, I think the oldest elsewhere with Native Americans about 13,000 years. We go back 65,000 years. Stonehenge is what, 5,000 years old? Mere baby. You know, so we've got this long culture and 
it's not, we're not saying biological. Genetically, you can probably go way back for everybody. But culture includes the art and the, the stories and the knowledge and all the rest. And we have evidence of it going back uh, continuously for this huge length of time. Now, if you want to be rigorous and pedantic, like people like me, being scientific people do, uh, you're looking at where have we got absolutely irrefutable evidence of this. Well, Patrick Nunn in The Edge of Memory had found 20 far, 21 locations round of groups of um, indigenous cultures around the coast who independently had stories of the coast flooding, um, which with the ice age uh, that date back 20,000 years. And there's so many that it couldn't be coincidence. So there's lots of examples, but I want to give you one example that comes up because people keep saying to me, oh, they could have looked at the landscape. And that's what I mean, landscape in this case, the geography and made up the stories and yeah, some of them match. Well, the stories of the crater lakes in Northeast Queensland, there's three crater lakes. That the show, stories have been shown, the oldest one formed, the volcano formed at 17,000 years ago. But what's really telling is there's other crater lakes that were formed 200,000 years ago and there are no stories about them. That's before Aboriginal, the, the science, you know, the 65,000 years that we know that Aboriginal people have been on this continent. There are no stories from before and there are consistent stories describing exactly the way a crater lake is formed. So it's a really robust system, I'm watching the time, a really robust system of storing information reliably. And it's dependent on two main things to make it that robust. One is that there's restricted business, secret business, secret men's business, secret women's business. Because if you don't regulate and control that information, you will end up with fake news. Do I need yeah. to explain that to anyone? And that there is a system built in to all Indigenous cultures I've looked at, and very much so in the Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures, uh, to ensure that accuracy. Plus, there's the secondly, the way they've integrated the techniques of song, movement, art, narrative, and country, integrated to make this really powerful memory system, which is associated knowledge system. Um, associated with the way the human brain works. Oh, by the way, I didn't mention emotion. Uh, your brain remembers things that you're emotionally engaged with much more, uh, which is why um, we'll hear about Seven Sisters. And my emotional reaction to that exhibition was unbelievable. So Margot can convey the power. And I just want to emphasize the promise. Mm. All these methods can be used in every single contemporary life schools and lifelong learning. We need to move music and art to the heart of the curriculum and have everyone sing their science and dance their mathematics and draw art and so on with narrative with vivid characters because the more vivid the characters that tell the story, the more emotionally engaged you become with it. So song lines are something that we should all be embracing they're not just for them <laughs> yes over to you Marga. Yep. yep well to 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 pick up the last line they're not just for them is that um uh say in this exhibition seven sisters which i'll get to explain in a minute but one of the the underlying and key messages is that we all live on this continent you know, we all share in the trials and the tragedies. We all share in taking responsibility for the heritage, uh, the long heritage. We're all legacies, if you like, of a deep history with a long human occupancy, regardless of whether we came here 10 years ago or 200 years ago. So, um, one of the key messages that moved people, I think, about in the Seven Sisters exhibition, which of course informs what I have written in the book, 
uh, the Songlines book, so they're, to me, indivisible, um, is that, um, you know, the elders are basically saying to all Australians that, you, you, you know, we don't mind sharing this continent with you, but you do have to know your stories beyond the last 240 years. Because if you don't, you can't belong here. You can't take root. You'll only be grafted, transplanted. You'll always think of us and them. There'll always be racism. There'll always be difference. Instead of this, we are here together. On a we are sharing a continent. We have a shared history. We have a shared future, and we have shared responsibility. So the main thing is if you don't take some own, and I mean you, meaning everybody, not just Aboriginal people, in fact, not only, not Aboriginal people, everybody else, that you, you need to, and I think it's what the power of this exhibition actually did. People did feel very inclusive. They did take that on. Most Aboriginal art exhibitions, and it's more than an art exhibition, of course, but most uh, Aboriginal exhibitions of, of, that have a lot of, you know, high visual content, they, people tend to go around and say, look, you know, aren't they clever people? Aren't they brilliant? Isn't that wonderful? Don't they do great artwork? You know, what's it got to do with me? So the thing about this exhibition and then this book and things that will come out, that will spawn from this is that it's got everything to do with you. You know, this is your culture too. If you live in this country, you cannot not, you cannot deny the 60,000 years that went before your arrival. So, you know, so people can take pride in the history of this continent rather than it only belongs to them. And nothing started, like my mantra, I was on some history summit for the Prime Minister once and my mantra, which I've had over and over repeatedly said, you know, Aboriginal history didn't finish in 1788 and Australian history didn't start in 1788, you know, so... You know, because we are, we all go through school fixated on this 1788 date as if nothing happened before, you know, like, so, and if it did, it was called prehistory. So, um, you know, so to break down a lot of the things that, you know, we've been boxed into through the Western education system needs to be unpacked and reevaluated. Now, to go back to um, a couple of points that um, Lynn brought up um, in relation to, I think I made a right note here, right, landscape. Now, the reason I made a point about land, here's a good story, right? So Rex Batterby, for many of you learned people here will know, is the man who taught Albert Namajira how to do watercolour painting in Aranda country. Now, um, now what Rex Batterby was doing, he was painting appealing views of nature. He was painting landscape that appealed. It superficially was wonderful, there's lovely shadows and ridges and textures, the composition, the colour. That's what he was doing. But when Rex, when Albert Namajira was painting, he was only painting his own country and he was painting it from the inside out. So he was painting, when he was painting, he was paying homage, if you like. Even though on the surface, his watercolours, although if you look closely at the, his watercolours, those that followed, and Rex Batterby's, you will see a degree of patination and a degree of continuity beyond the edges of the frame of the painting and the a flatness or that you won't see in a white person painting the same. There's no sort of recreation the same depth of field or things like that patination was more important so to put it simply Rex Batterby was painting landscape and Albert Namajira and his followers have been painting their country so so then we'd talk we'd call it land you know their land their country and so on so for the concept of country is if, if you just explain how we're going to talk to just explain um, country, for example, country has to be like a person. It has to be sung to, it has to be talked to. People worry over it, just like your own children or your mother. It's a personage, it's not just dirt or anything. So if for any reason the country is neglected, 
for a long period of time for a whole range of reasons. It will close up and die. It will lose its animation until the people who are responsible for that country re-nurture it through soul uh, and dance and performance and go there and reanimate it. And we talk about, you know, uh, it's another whole story. But anyway, if you see, if you so if you see country like that, then you can't see it as landscape. So um, let's explain that. Now, Seven Sisters, because I realized we were 750. Um, the Seven Sisters story, now, you know, in relation to what Lynn was saying, you know, you will remember things if they are a dramatic narrative and if they're sung and they're painted and they're performed, right, and they're told and they're, you know, in a whole range of contexts. So the Seven Sisters is one such example. So basically the story, simply put, is like all civilizations, we have epic sagas to like the Odyssey, the Ulysses, the Odyssey and the, what's it called? Iliad. <laughs> What's it called? Iliad. Iliad. And, you know, as Noel Pearson called the Seven Sisters, Australia's um, Genesis, you know, Book of Genesis. So, so, you know, there's this ancestral being who's a shapeshifter, who takes on a kind of human form, who pursues wrongfully, um, according to the, the rules of marriage, these seven sisters in order to possess them. And in order to possess them, he needs to find ways of luring them to him. To do that, he needs to transform himself into um, uh, a delectable or um, uh, things you need in order to survive in the desert in this case. So he transforms himself into delectable foods in season, into water, into shade, into various animals. Now he does this to so that they will be attracted to him and metaphorically they will consume him, which is you know in another sense a kind of sexual consumption. Um, and in, in another, it's you know, there's lots of layers. But but essentially, all of the encounters around the whole country, in fact, around the world, Ireland has seven sisters, Africa has seven sisters, lots of countries, because it's 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 sort of um, bounces off the Orion and Pleiades. Um, they, what they learn, just one example, what they learn is where the food and the water is and where the shade is. And they also learn that this man chasing these women is the wrong thing to do. And they learn that the elder sister is there to care and protect for the younger sisters and to ward this man away from them and so on. So it's just full of cultural transmission of knowledge and of risks in the desert and of survival in, in every way. So every encounter, every story you learn about the Seven Sisters is transmitted in this lovely story you'll always remember, as Lynn was saying, it's full of, you know, tragedy and comedy and obsession and lust and love and trickery and all the stuff we need to know about. Very Shakespearean, you might say. Um, so, so then you will tell stories like that for 60,000 years because, you know, you will remember. But if someone gave you a bloody encyclopedia and passed it on for five years, if you're lucky, um, you know, well, why would you remember it unless you're going on Bob Dyer's pick a box, just to show my age. Um, so anyway, so that that's that's um, kind of, I think, dovetails into what, what Lynn was saying about remembering story through story. Oh, third archive. You've got time to do anything with that? We've, uh, we can go about 15 minutes over normal time if you're happy with that. Yeah, no, I can give you five. I, I can do third archive in five. Um, it's so simple. Um, for example, just this exhibition called Seven Sisters Trackness, the song line Trackness Seven Sisters. The very fact that how, it, why it, I think why it had the, depth and substance and power it had is because it was a, a collaboration of a kind that we've not that hasn't been done before I believe certainly in the institutional world of exhibitions so all the traditional custodians across three deserts of which there were say 20 25 30 they were in this scheme the curators of country they were curators 
my I was a curator in a more choreographic sense, right? I had to take what they uh, had curated through country, meaning going back to the basic word of keeping and caring for country, but I had to, to present it, create something, an experience at the National Museum of Australia that um, was experiential and immersive as much as you could. It was about learning knowledge in an embodied way, looking up, looking down, looking along, actually physically being engaged, um, being subject to song and dance and so on, um, to, to not only to appeal to the average museum punter without dumbing it down and diminishing the the power the substance and the sophistication of this knowledge system now one of the things that really helped was we had an audio and uh, i think i don't know linda if you used it, the audio that yeah you know we didn't have go to painting one see the blue skies blue because the artist was feeling a bit depressed that day and there's a tree on the right and that's you know none of that stuff right these seven sisters took the, took the um, listener on a rambunctious, robust romp around the country. So they tracked, went with the seven sisters and they told jokes and they landed badly and they, you know, all sorts of stuff. So they were included in the conversation of this almost comedy, comedic, whatever the word is, um, and tragic event a, a romp around the country so you became included um so so we ended up then with a, a form of co-curatorship that meant curators of country work with the choreographer of the institutional world to create this amazing experience that had all the depth that that did what it did and and also it, everybody who went felt included because I had virtual elders on screen throughout the exhibition basically saying, you know, you're not boyers of our culture, you're part of it, come here, you're about time you grew up and learned some of this stuff. It's almost a sense of that. So um, the third archive then is, um, is like an exhibition like that is a third archive because it is the fusion or the coming together of a Western knowledge system and an Indigenous knowledge system. So going for native title, you know, people do native title you hear about now. Well, Aboriginal people have connection to country, but it's a traditional Western, uh, traditional um, Indigenous knowledge system. And the Westerners who have this whole law and whole institutional practice called native title have to bring these two systems together to create a native title determination. That's a third archive. A book like this is the third archive. So the power of both systems um, fusing and acknowledging it as power and not as corruption or diminution. That's probably my time, is it? <laughs> um, we've actually got a, we, we have a question to that that has been seconded by some of our well, audience, Margot. And both Margo and Lynn, I'd like you both to speak to it if you if you could. Um, and it's about um, the third archive in education, and we spoke a little about a little about how I work in this beautiful second archive built right on top of the first archive, and how can my profession, you know, how can we librarians uh, fuse fuse into uh, a space where the third archive is available, but also in uh, educating children. Uh, in in the uh, school system. So could you speak to that a little? Margot, mm -hmm. do you want to? No, no, Lynn, you, you kick off this one. Off this one. Okay, oh, I think oh. I noticed Paul Allen appear here, so I'll acknowledge, Paul, what we did, um, various educators, including Paul, is see what we could do in taking these, and this was at Malmesbury Primary School. So we created a song line, a timeline, we did it for history, but also other things, around the school um, grounds, posts starting from uh, before 1800, and then we could go backwards right round to the present. And 
we adults put in, well, this, if you walk through history on this, this is when the world wars happened. And this is the kids put in the first flushing toilet and the first footy match and that. But one little boy got there at the beginning and he said, I'm not being recognized anymore. I'm going to represent Aboriginal people. And he put his hands together and he said, I'm not being recognized anymore. And as we walked around and we got to the first flushing toilet and the footy matches and both world wars, he kept saying, you're still not recognizing me. We got to 1951 and I stood up on the stump and they all sang happy birthday to me. And he said, you're still not recognizing me. And we got all the way to 1967 and the referendum. Uh. And the effect on the kids that all that time Aboriginal people weren't recognized could never have been more powerfully shown. Mm. We also brought in um, the grandparents and parents and they walked it with the kids and the grandparents said, that's when I came to Australia and this is when your great grandparents came. And so they became emotionally and personally involved. Now, everything on that, if you've got Einstein there, you can whack off all your physics from that bit. It, that base layer can be used to layer more and more and more information. But one of the things I hadn't understood when I wrote Memory Craft and Memory Code, the power of was the characters, the seven sisters and their pursuer and everything, just how important adding characters in. And Paul came up as the art teacher, decided the kids would create their own characters. And I'm hoping Margot will come in and tell us about the creation of the sculptures of the seven sisters for the exhibition. Uh, because that's what Paul was drawing on. And the kids made their own characters and used those characters to tell stories. They did, acted out maths tables. They told all sorts of stories using their characters and each other's and they were very emotionally involved and everything came. And we wanted to call them something because to call them ancestors or Kachina like the Native American Pueblo would be inappropriate. So we decided to call them cheeky because that would be awfully cute and give them a bit of character until we Googled cheeky and you get a lot of bottoms. So that oh. went. Uh, Paul coined the term rapscallions, which is what I've been using ever since. And seven-year-olds saying rapscallion is so cute. And so that was just a general term we used for characters because how important they are. And so... We uh, just one more example, then I'll hand back because education is my thing. I'm, yeah. I'm actually at the moment negotiating talking with schools in London and all over the place about how do they bring these things into the curriculum. Uh, with song, the concept of force, the, oh, it's in the Victorian curriculum. All the students learnt force, and a week later, I quizzed every student at Malmesbury Primary and said, "Remember doing force last week in." Science, yes, what's force? Three of them told me it was a push or a pull. Half of them said it's when your parents or teachers or friends make you do stuff. And the rest said, may the force be with you, which is lovely uh, filmmaking, appalling science. As a physics teacher, I can tell you, don't like it at all. The music teacher there, uh, Joseph Bromley, had them sing a little song he put together of forces, a push or a pull, push or pull. I can't do it without the actions. In music, they sang it once in assembly, nothing for a week. I quizzed 70 out of 70 again, exactly the same words. And every single kid told me it was a push or pull. They all did the actions and they all laughed. Yeah. And I'm not saying sing everything, but your fundamental definitions, because otherwise the teachers were building on sand. They where every time they said force, the kids were thinking all sorts of things. So we can bring, that's just a skimping save, you know, of some of the things that have been done at Malmesbury. Uh, but that that's just one, the other thing we've done, and I don't know if Alice is here, she probably is, is African Lakasa, the equivalent to an Aboriginal Kulamon engraved with knowledge or secret things like Chiringa and that. These sort of devices where knowledge is associated, they're basically miniature memory palaces. Unbelievable how effective they are as memory devices that we've been using in school. I get more emails about La Casa from Memory Craft book than anything else. But 
Margot, if you can take over the characters and not, and everything else and whatever you want to say. <laughs> well, I don't think I have much more to add to that, actually. <laughs> well, um, in fact, when I was at the exhibition, firstly of, of the characters of the Seven Sisters yeah. themselves, and secondly, yeah. the dome you haven't mentioned. Oh, okay. So, um, yes, yes. Well, to pick up on Lynn's point, uh, about how to learn, uh, clearly being experiential is, is the obvious thing we're hearing here and that becomes, um, that's through song and dance and art and action and so on. But so this whole exhibition experiential, so where well, the first thing you meet when you come into the exhibition after a digital experience, immersive experience of a snake running around over the place and dots, we walk through a song line, then we meet the characters of the of the saga, of the narrative. So you meet seven sisters, an elder sister and a range of younger sisters and you meet, uh, it's all done in a sort of woven spin effects uh, with contemporary materials form. And then you meet the the Wadi Nyuru or the, the fellow, the relentless pursuer, um, straight up front sitting there. And throughout the exhibition, there's a number of things like the snake is a recurring motive. Now, the snake in all civilizations and cultures are to do with temptations, such as the, you know, the Garden of, um, what is it called? Um, Eden, <laughs> Eden, Eden, <laughs> whatever it is, a Christian one. Um, <laughs> um, you know, and it's also, you know, it's, it's fear, it's danger, it's temptation, it's, it's um, a maleness, right, in this context. So throughout the whole exhibition, the snake appears in various forms and carvings uh, under this dome, which uh, I'll talk to in, in a minute. And each of the, and the seven sisters appear flying. It's interesting, they fly. Later on, you see them flying in the air because, and I'll tell you why they're going from one song line. When you're a visitor, you actually walk the song line in this exhibition, you see, the wayfinders on the top of the plinths, the paintings and portals to place, at which are knowledge sites that I mentioned at the beginning. So you learn the story by, by looking at a picture, by looking at a painting. And on the plinth below, it will actually have Hunmu or the name of the actual place. And then you'll hear, hear or read the story. But then the sisters, there's one part where the sisters are actually in the air. Now this, and then, the last paint, and that's because their pursuer was so uh, hot in their trails, is too close to comfort in this story. So they said, whoa, this is too much. And they took off. And in the audio, you know, you hear them say, whoa, that's too bad. We're going to get up. Then they land 100 kilometers away in real country. And they don't land very well because they haven't done it for a while. They, whoa, that was a bit of a rough landing, wasn't it? So there's all this kind of humor it's not this sacred aboriginal stuff that you've got to sort of not look at or think about and so on so they have all this funny little titter tatter now these women aren't aren't um flying because they want to feel the wind in their hair they're flying to tell you that between that song line at that place and you know 100 kilometers that way don't walk there's no water don't go there you can't fly don't walk across the country so again, it's imparting knowledge about that country that you need to know in order to survive in it. And various of these incidents throughout will impart that knowledge. But then we have what we do have in there. And again, it feeds into this experiential, immersive and engaging way of learning um, is the dome. We have a dome, which is a seven meter dome. It you know, was certainly in 2018 and may still be the world's you know, highest resolution traveling dome. And you go into it and it's actually, a, it is a replica of a place called Cave Hill in the APY lands on the tri-state border. Um, and it's, you know, reputedly the only Seven Sisters rock art site in the world. Um, and over many years, uh, we got to do the photogrammery and you lie under this K under this dome and you get transported if you like to Cave Hill and you hear the whispering voices of the elders and you see 
the story being animated and you see the transit of Orion and Pleiades and a whole range of stuff that actually you really are drawn into it, you really are immersed into it. And there's no way if once you've seen and experienced that, that's 20, 20 minutes, I think, you will never, ever erase it from your mind. No. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Overwhelming. Yeah. I went back yeah. three times, and I just mentioned where the dome's going from now on, and the whole exhibition. Well, the exhibition has um, will pop up in Perth in the West Australian Museum in uh, you know the end of this month. We're in the middle of actually installing this thousand square meter, three hundred object, you know, twenty five bits of multimedia all by camera just like we're doing now right all remotely and it's a study it will look better in Perth than it looked in Canberra because of the the venue um, and then it goes to Paris Berlin the UK um, they're all signed up and then we're working on New York Finland Canada so I reckon it'll probably last longer than me <laughs> and deserves to it'll It'll travel forever, and it's true. Like it was, it, you can't. I cannot. Um, if any of you really want a seriously good uh, experience, I don't know how to put it in simply, but in the ways that we've been talking about, you really need to get your ass to Perth. Um, and it's there till November April. to April. April. Should hey? be allowed in by then. Oh, you can now. Or we can. Canberra, we can just fly in, but I don't know about you, Mo. No, Victoria's um, not yet. We yeah. will. But anyway, between November, end of November and, and April next year, um, and, you know, I'm sure Lim will attest to it, it really is transformative. It's not like any other exhibition you've got. I mean, I say that because Philip Adams was going on. I couldn't believe it. I didn't even know he'd been. And he was saying last night, these late night five shows, this is a great, you know, he's not one, he's not abusive, you know, he's like a you know, chilled out. But he was going on it. This is the greatest show I've ever seen. This is the greatest show on earth. <laughs> so, you know, don't take my word for it. <laughs> take Philip's word. So anyway, um, once it leaves the shores in April next year, that's it. I don't think we'll see it back in Australia. Um, you know, in my lifetime anyway. So there you go. Robin, have you got questions we can answer in one word or two words? Um, no, I'm looking through the questions and I think that the presentation has answered most of them. Um, people are welcome to email the library if they feel there's something that you didn't cover and we will chase you. Oh, no questions. Uh, there are questions, but I think they're questions that you've covered oh, right. yeah, okay. uh, in, in your okay. in the presentation. Um, actually, there's, there's, there's one here that I think, Margot, would be interesting to, to talk about. And it's about um, you know, the physicality of travelling to um, travelling to country and travelling to sites. And you also mentioned that, you know, many of the elders are, are on dialysis and, you know, not, not particularly well people. And, and what accommodations are made for, um, for people who are frail? Um, and you know, does, does knowledge come to them, was the question? Or, or, or more generally, what... Um, What's um, it makes no difference um, whether on dialysis or not because it's such a. I think of some of the people like you know Wendy Williamson, who's kind of the major spokesperson that I work with. She's been on, on dialysis for like fifteen or twenty years, and regularly, like the other night, must have been something in Adelaide, and they were doing the Seven Sisters Dukapa. So they. It, it gives them life, if you know what I mean. Like they were performing somewhere in Adelaide, like in the evening, and some of these people in wheelchairs on dialysis, they all get somehow it gives them the power, if you like, or the energy. The jukapa is what keeps them, um, what's the word, nourished like it does with country. Yeah, so now it has no detrimental effect like we the, when we started this really probably in 2012 we we were very we really didn't think all those elders who were so desperate for this to happen would still be around in 20 you know 18 let alone 2020 and the ones none of the ones who worked with have passed so who knows you know what magic healing you know <laughs> there is inside that I don't know. 
Robin, can you Hi. hold up the book? I saw one question, where can people get it? Every okay. bookshop should have it at the moment, right, Margot? Oh, um, yes, it seems to be out there now, and certainly Booktopia. Um, yeah. Certainly, you could have got on that about a week or two back, but it's certainly in our bookshop and I believe others. And Stoneman's in Castlemaine, no personal bias. But yeah, I'm um, definitely. Yeah. And it's only, it should sell for no more than $19.99, and it, I've seen it at 17 and 18 and it is intentionally designed to, um, you know, to make accessible for, for the education of people and to the education market in particular, which is everybody, really, everybody. <laughs> Yeah. I'd, I'd just like to, to wind up by saying it was a great 20 bucks that I spent. <laughs> okay. And, and uh, as, as well as in enjoying both of your writing styles, um, the way it gently challenged me professionally as, oh. as a second archive holder, that's what I do, that's how I make my dollars. Uh, but the invitation for everybody to explore the third archive was, it was the thing that just touched me right here. Oh, and fantastic. Thank you both. Yeah, you should be proud to be an Australian living on this ancient continent. It's obviously got you. Yeah. Good. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. folks, uh, thank you all. We might wind up there. Um, Margot and Lynn, this was just magic for me. I'm going to add a little personal thing. I'm a white fella, but I've got Wiradjuri kids. Don't apologise for being white. Yeah. Um, and um, it's it's been a struggle for for me to um, to work with my son. He's a, he's an adult. Yes. And so much about white fella life that I can teach him. Yes. And there's so much that I just don't know about uh, the world of his mothers and the world of his mother. And my daughters, they can talk to my mum, to them. Yeah. My son, he can talk to me about lots and lots of stuff, but not everything. And so the learning for me has to be lifelong because it's yeah. my relationship. And it's, uh, it's events like these that absolute feed, absolutely feed me personally. Mm. And when we have First Nations people and First Nations content at our libraries, we mm. all draw the Wappen crowds. So uh, the message is getting out there. So well done to both of you and thank yeah. you so much for Ooh, this evening. Thank you. But can I say your son is the third archive? Mm. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and can I also He's out of my eyes. <laughs> here's your third archive. And can I ask again, um I, I saw there was a question here about how people could access this like it's recorded, obviously, and you said something about YouTube. Can someone tell me, because I've got family who I'd like to yes, see it, this. Yes, it will be hosted on the Goldfields YouTube channel as okay. well to access afterwards. Okay, thank you. Goldfields Libraries YouTube. Okay. Okay, well, thanks, Lynn. It's great yarn <laughs> again. Yeah, it is. And what I loved was one of the reviews saying that this is an act of intellectual reconciliation. Yes. And that's think, what I want it to be most of all. I think that was on our book. Was one yeah, I think they quoted it on the book. Yeah, it was one of the endorsements. We've got oh, right. endorsements. Yes. You're right. Yeah. Bye-bye, everyone. Okay. okay. Bye. Bye. See you. Tea time. Bye.